Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, YouTubers. This is Jerry Diamond with How to Get Out of Babylon. And uh, I am not recovered from last night. It was 2.30 in the morning. I just wanted to get something out. And been a lot of things on my heart, and uh, I'll go into that. I uploaded a video, and I hope it doesn't get a strike against it. It's from the Psalms for crying out loud, so nobody should get upset about it. Of course, it was Rich Mullins, but hey, he's dead, and he wouldn't care if he was alive. It's an amazing story about him. Um, an arrow pointing to heaven. Biography about him. I, I, I uh, a little bit about myself. <laughs> you know, I became a believer, 73, through the uh, kind of a under-shepherd ministry, I would kind of say, of... Uh, a charismatic church uh, through a choir. The guy teaching the choir was a Methodist, and he he had begun been a drug dealer in Rockford, Illinois, uh, guitar player and whatnot. So, anyway, he got saved, and uh, eventually he was the one that Father used to bring me to salvation. That's not the story here, so I'll try to stay on point because I am tired, and. Um, so I got, I got saved through that ministry, and it was, it's, it's, it's a whole lot of things involved there. Um, so, hang on. So, I, I had never, I don't know, I, I, I didn't listen to music a lot. So, that was like my initial exposure to music at all. Uh, of course, in, in high school, I mean, I did listen to some music, and I was like a very mellow type person, so I gravitated toward the Moody Blues, you know. I was actually working with a guy, and he was like a heavy metal guy, and uh, not Judas Priest, but um, King Crimson and some just bizarre bands, and he said, I know what you like. You like the Moody Blues. And I'm like, how did you know? Because <laughs> that's what you are. So anyway, that was about the only thing I'd listened to, and of course, pop music, you know, uh, Mom, papas and mamas and mamas and papas and you know all that stuff. I mean, I heard m music, whatever music was on the radio. Okay, so da da da. Fast forward. Um, so I liked Christian music, and then I then I started going to uh, a church. And at first, I would not sing the hymns. When they sang hymns, I'd sit down. I didn't like them. And then I started reading some of the hymns. I started reading. Theology, and this is part of what I want to be talking about here in the next little while. Um, kind of my theological background and whatnot, biblical and theological background. Um, so I I went from sitting down when they sang the hymns to loving the hymns, having every one of them memorized, well, most of them, you know, the better written ones. Um, the foo for all the fuzz, fluff, and flummery ones, as I call them. I, you know, I don't really get off on those at all. I still don't. I don't really sing them much. But the ones that have a, a heavy, you know, biblical basis, I, I like them. And to this day, I don't pretty much don't need a hymnal. If I if I if I if I like the hymn, I don't need the hymnal. If I don't like the hymn, I'm not going to sing it anyway. So I don't need the hymnal. Kind of like studying for a math test. You know, why would you study for a math test? You either understand it or you don't. You either like it or you don't. I loved it, so <laughs> I never studied for math tests. Um, so anyway, I uh, became more theological, and then that, that went from um, reading uh, books on prayer to reading books about men of prayer, um, you know, E.M. Bounds, I've mentioned before Leonard Ravenhill, um, you know, Hugo went to Magalia. Why? Because he had a vision. Judson went to Burma. Why? Because he had a vision. Hudson Taylor went to China. Why? Because he had a vision. Henry Martin went to India. Why? Because he had a vision. Robert Muddy McShane went to Israel. Why? Because he had a vision. Why don't you do anything? Because you have a vision. Television. We're going to get into that. Why we as a remnant people are not doing 
anything. So, part of the message. Stick with it. Um, so, music, yeah, I, and, and then over the years, I, I um, so I went from, you know, liking a lot of the Christian music of the day, went to a lot of concerts, Children of the Day, um, oh my gosh, I went to, <laughs> never forget this one, <laughs> Larry Norman. Why should the devil have all the good music? I went to hear him at Calvary Chapel in Denver, Calvary Temple. And uh, front row seat. I had a front row seat. Oh, I was so excited. And that boy came out, California boy. Blonde, straight, hair down to his butt. And my mouth fell open and I was like, oh. Uh, it was a shock, but it was an awesome concert. Great, great man, great man of God, wonderful. He's the one that just he did crossover Christian music, you know. Uh, if you're not familiar with him, look, look, you re listen to some of his songs. I mean, they're just, you know, the quintessence of taking music and, and uh, making it, you know, real hard, you know. Well, we'll syncopate it. They say that the syncopated music's on the... Uh, wrong side of the pearly gates. Well, we're going to syncopate it so they know which side it's on. Anyway, um, one concert I went to, and I'll never forget this one. <laughs> What's going on with that? Oh, no, 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 what that? Ah, ah. Oh, it shut up. Okay. Gary, Gary, Gary. Oh, Good thing I opened my eyes here. Um, I could go to a different screen, maybe, but. I don't know what else to do right now. I'm just going to sit here and talk for a little while. Okay, so... <laughs> um, guy had just gotten saved, a musician, a secular musician. And he was in concert. And it was an acoustic concert. There's another guy named Paul Clark, which nobody listening to this has probably ever heard of. Maybe one of you have. If you have ever heard of Paul Clark, let me know. So it's Paul Clark and this other character... The other character, I knew Paul Clark, you know, he was famous to me, but the other guy was like, eh, who's he? Well, fast forward, well, that would have been in 1973, 83, 93, 03, 13, you know, 40-some years. And I, because at the time I thought, eh, this guy, is he going to be a flash in the pan, or is he going to be, you know, is he going to really stick with it? Is, is he going to be a true believer? <laughs> Well, he wrote a song, funny, I thought of that. He wrote a song called True Believer. Phil Keggy. <laughs> Get this, acoustic concert. I walked out on him because it was too loud for my virgin ears. You know, I wasn't used to loud music. Uh, I walked out on him, I kid you not. Whoa, terrible. Years later, I'm sitting there uh, 15 feet from the speakers at a Poison concert 15, 20 years later. I didn't go to hear Poison. I went to hear um, Ted, Terrible Ted, Motor City Madman, um, Ted Nugent, and the damn Yankees. But anyway, so my taste in music obviously changed somewhat, and that's I'm not even going to try to do all that. Um, I'll explain what happened and why and the wherefore. There was a method in my madness. So I walked out on that. I wondered if Phil Keggy would ever, if he was going to stick with it, he was going to, you know, become a flash in a pan or, you know, one one hit wonder or if he was going to really be a, a true believer. And, hey, man, saw him in Kansas City a while back. I didn't even know what he was doing. He, he had a foot recording thing and it, um, and he, he would, he tapped out a rhythm just on the guitar. Dum, 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 dum. And then he fiddled with the thing, and he played a melody, and he fiddled with it, and he did another track, and he was recording the whole thing. He did echoing, he did harmony, he did the background, and by the time he was done, he'd done True Believer, like an entire orchestra. I, I figured out what he was doing toward the end of it, and I was just absolutely blown away, remembering the day when I walked out on him, <laughs> and wondered if he was going to be a true believer. Oh, God. 
guy with nine fingers, and if you know the story, it's one of those, um, what do you call them, uh, urban legends, but uh, somebody once asked Jimi Hendrix, how does it feel to be the greatest guitar player in the world, and Jimi Hendrix's reply was, and this is, this is covered in Rolling Stone magazine and everything, you know, nobody will ever be able to prove it, there's stories both ways, but Jimi Hendrix's, and I, I would believe it, Jimi Hendrix's reply was, I don't know, you'd have to ask Phil Keggy. I mean, he is that good. He is that good. So, um, anyway, that's just kind of a little bit of background there, and how in the world I got into that. Um, you know, uh, the other night, the other night, uh, Jersey sent me a link to a uh, L.A. Marzulli, and the guy was tired at the beginning of the meeting. I've watched some of the video; it's on Nephilim, Nephilim, but uh, he didn't get squirrely. But by the, toward the end of it, as he got into it, he's tired or tired, and he, he just got, he would lose his train of thought, and he was up on bunny trails, and he admitted it, and he was laughing and goofy and, and having a good time and getting the information out, and some guy wrote in on the comments and section on the YouTube and said, man, you're acting like a little eight-year-old kid, you know? <laughs> you know? I'm like, hey, I, I know how he feels, you know? Um, what's the sense in having a, acting like an adult, you know? Um, stay young. But uh, but I, I would say, hey, hey, dude, you know, that man has, because of his dedication and his devotion and lack of sleep and the drive and the, you know, pushing to get information out to people and writing books and traveling and going on archaeological expeditions, he has lost more brain cells than you'll ever have. So that, that would be my comment to the little character, the, lung, the young whippersnapper, you know. Go up, thou bald head. Go up. Yeah, watch it. <laughs> Forty. Now, see, bears could come out and tear up 42 kids when they say that. 42 is a number of judgment, by the way. Okay, so we are under judgment. We are in Babylon, and I just felt that that would be a good way to start this off and what I want to talk about. And uh, we're in Babylon, you know, and... We lay down and wept, wept for thee, Zion. We remember thee, remember thee, we remember thee, Zion. Now, I want to say this just briefly, because I'm going to come back around. I don't even, not even begun to do the, I, I've, I've done this study one time, and I'd recommend that you do this. R study what Zion is in Scripture, okay? You have what everybody, most people are familiar with is world Zionism, and it ain't good. Um, you know, read where that came out of. It came out of Babylon and the Talmud. Um, how in the world a people who are judged, think about this for just five minutes, ten minutes maybe, as I'm talking about it, at least spend that much time thinking about it. How a people who were judged for not keeping Sabbath, 70 years in Babylon was a judgment, okay? 70 weeks, 70 Sabbaths, 70 years of Sabbaths. Um, it was a penalty and for idolatry and whatnot. How in the world they go into Babylon and come out with the Babylonian Talmud, or whenever that, you know, that, that's where it came from. And, and how anybody could, in any, in any sane course of thinking, reasonable course of thinking, um, believe that they could be, have anything to do with the things of God or the kingdom of God. What am, what am I saying? You know, I hope you're following me. You know, um, when Babylon took Judah into captivity, okay, wait, let me back up here. When Assyria invaded Israel, they captured, there were basically, it, it, back in those days, you had a city and that was a fort, that was a fortress, okay, and that was like your, a city state as in Greece, you know, Sparta, 
Athens, you know, you had city, states, city, kingdoms. So you had six kingdoms in Judah. That was the southern kingdom, okay, below the line. That's the southern kingdom down here. Six. Okay. Can you count this? Use, use five fingers and then another one. This is very important. Five of those cities were taken by Assyria. Do you understand that? Okay. It's very important. Judah. Who is Judah? Who is the tribe of Judah? Think about it. Where did David come from? Where did Messiah come from? Go back even further. Genesis 49.10. Okay. What does it say? The scepter. You don't even know what that word means. I'll bet nobody listening to me right now can tell me what that word means right now off the top of your head and from your heart and from your head. Not one person. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, Yehuda, from the praising of Yahweh is what that word means. Nor a lawgiver, and you don't know what that word means, from between his feet, and nobody knows what that word means until Shiloh, tranquility, comes to the obedient, gathered people who will be under distress kind of my interpretation, my partial version of it, not the full version, because I'm not going to even tell you what it means. Not the time, not the place. Okay, point is, Judah, 5-6, five, 5-6 six, five, six of Judah went into captivity with the northern ten tribes who became lost. Disappeared out of biblical history. Where did they go? I don't know. They got lost. They went up into Assyria. Assyria used them as a buffer zone. They didn't. They weren't like slaves, like in Egypt, and they weren't, you know, beat under like in Babylon. They, they said, hey, these are a bunch of really good freaking warriors. Let's put them on the border for crying out loud. Now they put them on the border. They're not stupid. They put them on the very far side of the entire empire of Assyria from where they used to live. So they would have one heck of a time going AWOL from their assigned duties guarding the walls, guarding the borders. And ever since, these people have been border type clans, people, tribes, nations. The border? Danger? Killing? Giants? Fun! You know, let's go. So, a lot of them. It's in their blood. Going way back. So, what happened when Assyria fell? They all said, Hey, we had so much fun in Babylon, let's go back. No. I mean, we had so much fun in Assyria, we enjoyed being under captivity so much, let's go to Babylon. That's the rising dictatorship. That's the rising empire. Nah. Did they go back toward Babylon? No. Did they go back through Assyria? No. They were north of Assyria. They went north. What is directly north of where they were? Mm, two big seas that you could not get across unless you had really good ships. The Caspian, the BC, Bill Clinton, the BC seas the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, okay? I have some things up here. I'm not ready for this, but too bad. So we're in Babylon. That's what we're dealing with here. So, um, And so that, that's the text for today. Psalm 137, by the way. Um, so they're in Assyria. Assyria declines in power. Babylon is rising. They don't go back to Israel because it's going toward Babylon and Egypt and everything else, so they just go north, most of them. And in between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea is the Caucasus Mountains. Now, in those mountains, supposedly on some ancient maps, there is a course, a place called a, a, the Pass of Israel. 
they went through the Caucasus Mountains. Now, oddly enough, they disappeared from biblical history, and nobody knows where they went. And you hear the um, statement of the Ten Lost Tribes. And the funny thing is that nobody knows where the Caucasian people came from. Uh, this is attested to by a song called White Boy. Ooh, that's a bad term. That's a racist term. Well, it was a term by a song by Jefferson Starship, or Jefferson Airplane, in a booth, in a booth, in a, on an album entitled Baron Von Toll Booth and the Chrome Nun. That don't, where, you know, what, where that came from, I don't know. But anyway, it says, uh, white boy, white boy, you don't have a homeland, you never did, you never will. You don't know where you came from. You have, you, there's no homeland you call your own. Um, you appeared in the Caucasus Mountains of southern Russia now and spread your peculiar doctrine from Mexico to Moscow. Something to Moscow. So anyway, all right, all uh, <clears throat> we're by the waters of Babylon. So, so here's the point. If you haven't figured it out, every one of those, however million people that were deported okay, by Assyria from Judah along with the ten tribes were of royal blood, every one of them. So you lost ten tribes to history from biblical history. Ten nations appear in Europe, all of them with their own kings and queens. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. I don't know either. You know, so... It's 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 just it's funny, providential, protective, always the father's always got a plan and it's always deeper, and goes way back, you know. It's like the white witch that kills Aslan in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. She didn't know that when a life was freely given in sacrifice for another, that time works backwards, and so he he became alive again after she killed him. So. Anyway, that's kind of kind of what happened. So a lot a lot of stories there. So back to uh, the whole Babylon and um, you know a little bit of history there about the royalty, the royalty of, of Europe, all come from Judah. Um, so and many of them from you know David. So, but uh, so now I wanted to I'm going to pull up another screen here. So I'm going to pause it. All right, so uh, I, 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 this, I hope this will tie together. Um, I just want to jump forward a few years, 1600s, and what I'm leading up to is like we're 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 going to see storms. We're going to see difficult times. You know, um, read Matthew 24. You know. Predictions of uh, the what life is going to be like in the end times, and we're going to see storms. This this uh, whole Armageddon line and the uh, you know the uh, grand solar minimum and wintry storms raging fierce um, as they are right now for some people. Uh, we need to have some. If a lot of you, a lot, we're either going to have it or we don't. And some people may develop it. There was a point made the other day that uh, on the, one of the, I think it was on one of the uh, Shofari and uh, Pastor Joe Fox's guys, Millennial Man or Revolting Man. I think it was Millennial Man, but, you know, somebody made the comment on there that, um, you know, people are going to show up and they're not going to necessarily be prepared you know, they're not going to show up with a lot of uh, skills and stuff. And I was like, amen to that, you know, because what's going to happen is you've got people who are, um, they're going to naturally survive. They're going to have the innate sense, common sense ability, the uh, drive, the capacity to do what needs to be done to get to where they need to go. Okay. Um, 
my brother-in-law is a hard character. And he, uh, his comment is, because when I, I shouldn't say this at this point, <laughs> since he already mentioned it. Uh, what the heck. Um, you know, leader of a church and whatnot. But, uh, you know, I said, man, you need to get some storage food. I'm like, why? My neighbor weighs 300 pounds, you know, so. Uh, hard, you know. You should get an assault rifle. Why? <laughs> I, I've got a sniper rifle. <laughs> I can get a hunting rifle or a, a assault rifle anytime I want, you know. There's people like that out there, you know. They're just, and here's what he said. He, he says, um, in the septic tank of life, there are sinkers and there's floaters. And I'm a floater, so, yeah, kind of a gross way to put it, but hey. Um, and my contention for years has been that there's not going to be very many, if any, survivalists in God's ark, in the divine ark. Because a lot of them, what does it mean to be, to be safe, to be a survivalist? You know, what does it mean? Are you surviving physically, or are you intending to survive spiritually through you know all eternity you know where do you where do you want to spend eternity well most survivors that i know of I, I talked to a guy right here i hate to say it you know right here in missouri who told me that he people he knows preppers christian preppers their plan is when the shit hits a fan they're going to go kill their christian brother and take all of his stuff you know uh they ain't going to be spending time in a kingdom, let me tell you. They will be spending time in a very hot place. You commit murder, you're a murderer. If you are a drunkard most of your life, you're a drunkard. Drunkards shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. If you lie all the time, you're a liar. Liars will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, you know... Uh, survivalism is is uh, Christian survivalism is an oxymoron, one of the greatest oxymorons in history. Okay, so biggest, worst, whatever, nastiest. Um, so you're going to be survivors. What does that mean? You know, so some people are going to show up and they're just going to have gotten there. You know, they they made it. They did what they had to do. They you know, they, they played by the rules. You know, as um, uh, Michael Peebles, Pastor Michael Peebles at a, in Dogwood, Missouri, um, you know, he says every single person, every single farm out here in the Ozarks should have 10 to 50 people with a 55-gallon drum or a Connex, whatever, a car, you know, cargo shipping container, whatever they want, a cabin with their stuff in it. So their family has a place to go and they have stuff there already. And he says, the first one shows up, you take them down to a spring, they're not going to live on your place. You take them down to a spring, five miles down the road, and you said, this is where you're camping. Here's your stuff. Here's your rule book, scriptures. Play by it. Don't mess up. Because by and large, this is a saying from a series of men's adventure books. And I don't know how it's going to be. But there's going to be rules in the kingdom, and we're going to play by them. Or you won't be in the kingdom. You commit murder, you're out. You know. Um, so, series of books, uh, Out of the Ashes. That's the first type, first book in the series, and they're just a sci-fi adventure. You know, shoot 'em up. But the guy in there, uh, General uh, Rains, Ben Rains, the saying in his group, his rebel group. Um, was, uh, uh, sir, this is a one-mistake society, and you just made yours. There's not going to be namby-pamby, uh, put them in jail for five years so they can learn how to crack safes and do all this other stuff and run a drug drug operation from prison. No. Ain't no prisons. There's no prisons in the Bible. Where do you see a prison in the Bible? There's places, of, there's cities of refuge, there's places to go to be safe in case you did accidentally kill somebody. You can go to that city of refuge and, and maybe hopefully get a square, you know, good deal, a square, you know, a, a fair shake or ch a chance, you know. Um, you could grab on the horns of the altar and hopefully somebody don't come in and 
stab you in the back while your horn, your hands are hanging on the horns of the altar. The cornices of the altar, the horns, the cornucopias, the... Anyway, another story, another day. Um, so that is, you know, it's important. So, um, so Judah, you know, goes into captivity with Israel. And that's where we're playing to here. We're, you know, I'm going to skip ahead and we'll come back around and come back to that, you know, from a different angle. But I wanted to skip ahead a few hundred years and come here to Scotland. And uh, Scotland was settled about, you know, uh, 400 A.D., invaded and settled by the Scots, pretty much. Uh, Ireland, oddly enough, was settled about 1,000 B.C. by the Irish, or whatever, tribe of Dan. They went by ship. Both of the people settling those two nations were from two brothers, Calcol and Darda. And I'm not going to go into that right now. Perez and Zera, long story. Okay, another another <laughs> massively huge bunny trail. That's more than a bunny trail. It's like a mastodon trail. So, uh, <laughs> but Scotland, you know, one of the countries that we we got a lot of our free thinking from them there's a book called lex rex the law is king the law meaning the law of god old and new testaments that is king kings back in those days believed that the king is law whatever the king wanted to do that was law you see it in movies all the time um henry the eighth and blah 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 you know edward the you know, edward longshanks you know William Wallace, the whole nine, the whole nine yards there. Brave heart, but um, the king is law. Well, Samuel Rutherford said the law is king. The prince, the law is king. The law is the prince, and he was not liked by the king, and so they passed a sentence to call him before the high court and the high jury, and and he was on his deathbed, and he wrote back and said, you know. Um, before your day appear, you know, I shall be summoned before a higher judge and a higher jury, and I will be where few kings and nobles ever go. And he wasn't happy about it. He would have loved to have faced a martyr's death. But it didn't happen for him. It did for a lot of Scots. So I'm just going into a little bit of our, you know, our people's history, Israel, remnant people. A lot of it's in your blood and you don't know it. A lot of it's in your heart and your head and you don't know it. You've been squeezed and you've been pressured and you've been put under heat and you've been, you know, pummeled and you've rolled with the blows and you're you're still alive and kicking like me, you know, barely. You know, I wonder. And so the the thing is is that there's a there's a reason for that. There's a reason there's certain people being called. And there's a reason that there's a gathering and there isn't for where that gathering is. And there's a reason for the type of people being, you know, sensing to come here. So, and I, I want to, I'll, I'll go back and I, I, you know, got off on a little funny trail. But uh, Zion, what is Zion? We remember the Zion. Do a study on that. Um, when it, Zion is a is a concept, it's not a place. It doesn't mean that you, because you've been given this land in 1948, you have the right to rule the world and call everybody cattle. And and you know, it's okay to have sex with a three year old girl and it no, doesn't hurt her any more than poking her eye out. And you know, and uh, all the filthy trash in the Talmud and all the horrible horrific stuff that they do and have and done and have planned for this world that we live in and for us goyim as cattle um, but uh, Zion was at first it was just a part of a little of Hebron and then it became a larger place and then it became basically Jerusalem the, the, the settlement of Jerusalem was Zion and then it became bigger and it was eventually a walled city uh, the the greatest fortified city, the five 
five cities that Assyria took, the only one they did not take was Jerusalem. Now, when they go back, did all of those people that went into Babylon go back? No. No, they, they, were, they were gone. Okay? The people that went into captivity to, with Assyria, the five, six of them, who were, you know, in Europe. And by that time, you know, who knows? Um, early on, a lot went to Ireland. Ireland was settled 1000 A.D., or B.C., rather, B.C., Zara and Calcol, Zara's descendants, Calcol and Darda, Dardanelles, Darda went to Ireland. So anyway, um, and you'll see that in their, their coats of arms, red hands, red threads, red cords, scarlet, scarlet threads, scarlet cords. So runs through all of Scripture, Judah, the cords that he gave Tamar, and uh, well, the red cord that uh, they escaped, the sky, the skies escaped, Spies escaped from Jericho. Rahab, the harlot. Tamar dresses up as a harlot. Rahab was a harlot. You know, Ruth seduced Boaz, and Bathsheba played the harlot. So this this scarlet scarlet thing runs through a whole, all of those women's lives. Pretty fascinating, I think. Um, so uh, the you know Judah. The, that, that royal blood is, is very widespread by that time throughout the world, pretty much. So, Calcol, Darda, um, it, uh, Ireland, and Scotland. So, let's go to Scotland here and, and kind of, I want to read this poem. Um, and this is just going to kind of give you an idea of the, uh, I don't know, I, I have, let me, let me say this and then I want to just get into it, but, uh, I've realized one of the things that needs to happen is I need to get, and I just asked for prayer on this, need to get a uh, rail, a Connex, a uh, shipping container over to my family farm. And been prepping since 1980, a lot of things here. But one of the biggest things is a library. Uh, it's in a shed that has a plastic fur roof and used barn tin. I mean, one layer of black plastic and barn tin. And there are books there that are antiques. You know, leather-bound books from printed in England, London. Puritan works, you know, Reformation works. So, that needs to happen. I need to get that stuff. And, and here's, I want to just say a little bit here. You know, for a lot of years there, I, I realized a year going years back that um, I was. Uh, oh man, I'm plugged in. Oh well. Uh, going years back that you know I, I was basically put outside the camp and and homeless. I had homeless camp number one, homeless camp number two, and homeless camp number three right there on the properties that my family owns. And even though I'm the head of the clan, I'm is, is in biblically I own all of that. Biblically I own in my estimation. You know, you, know, you can read you can read the scriptures and see that, you know. You know, okay, I own seventy acres. You know, I, I brought it or brought our family here and I you know, it was my money that paid for it, it was my, my vision, my uh my work, my blood, sweat and tears that not one of my sons will ever, ever be able physically or mentally to push themselves to the to the limits that I did. You know, fifty two hours straight, packing, loading, driving, unloading, driving, loading, unloading. But anyway, um and yet, you know, I'm homeless. So I, I came to understand, I was like, I'm in the cave of a doolum, you know. And I, I wanted to have it like a plaque made up, you know, put it over the trailer where I, you know, it's my friend is letting me use, you know, for as long as I need it, the Airstream, you know, the cave of Adullam. Well, I'm over here in this farmhouse now, and, and it's like I'm, you know, David, when he, after all those years of persecution and fight and, and warfare and everything, you know, he, he, there came a time when he had some peace, and not that it, the, everything's over, but I am feeling at least like I have some kind of, um, 
I've got time to sit here and talk and study and think and pray and and I don't I don't have any interference and I don't have any um I have not had any weird input from anything here. No temptation, no no TV, no nothing. That's awesome. So all right. So covenanters, I'm not going to go into the story cuz it's just a I could just talk on it for forever, but the library they have and the 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 history that I immersed myself in. This will give you a little bit of an idea here. These people, um, phenomenal people. They are the uh, the basis. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt made a statement. He says, "If it weren't for the Scottish Covenanters, America would not exist." They maintain freedom. Okay. So, and I'm going to check the time here. Didn't mean to do that. So I'm going to read this, and then we'll see. You know, I may make a few comments, and I may not. But uh, I, earlier today, I had the phraseology went through my mind. Nobody will have ever heard this before, but the phrase hit my mind, and he, by the gleam of sheeted lightning, oped the sacred book. And I was talking to Jersey on the phone earlier, and I said, you know, let's see what Chrome, how Google, you know, Chrome, how, how, you know, how I can Google that up, and I did, and so, and I had part of it I could just recite from memory, a lot of it. I had never read the entire poem, and I have books that have these type of things in them, the, the stories of the Covenanters. There's a book called Fair Sunshine, one of the most, just a neat, neat, beautiful book, short, but has about eleven or fourteen. Um, stories, uh, biographies, brief biographical, biographical sketches of people who were martyred during this time period, the killing times. And, uh, and one of them were two, uh, two maids, two women, older one, an old lady and a young lady. They staked them out with the tide coming in, you know, on, on stakes and let them drown. Cold water, you know, freezing cold water and whatnot, so... Anyway, this is a Sabbath in the country, persecutions of the Covenanters. It is not only in the sacred fane that homage should be paid to the Most High. There is a temple, one not made with hands, the vaulted firmament, far in the woods, almost beyond the sound of city chime, at intervals heard through the breezeless air when not the limberous leaf is seen to move, save when the, where the linnet lights upon the spray, when not a floweret bends its little stalk, save where the bee lights upon the bloom, there wrapped in gratitude and joy and love, the man of God will pass the Sabbath noon. Silence his praise, his disembodied thoughts, loosed from the load of words, will high ascend beyond the Empyrean. Nor yet less pleasing at the heavenly throne, the Sabbath service of the shepherd boy. In some lone glen, where every sound is lulled to slumber, save the tinkling of the rill, or the beat of bleat of lamb, or hovering falcon's cry. Stretched on the sward, he reads of Jesse's son, or sheds a tear o'er him to Egypt sold, and wonders. Why he weeps. The volume closed. With time sprig laid between the leaves, he sings the sacred lays. His, liqui, his weekly lesson conned with meekle care, with great care, beneath the lowly roof, where humble lore is learnt, where humble worth pines unrewarded by a thankless state. Thus reading, hymning, all alone, unseen, the shepherd boy the Sabbath holy keeps, till on the heights he marks the straggling bands returning homeward from the house of prayer. In peace they home resort, O blissful days, when all men worship God as conscience wills. Far other times our fathers' grandsires knew a virtuous race to godliness devote. They stood prepared to die, a people doomed to death, old men and youths and simple maids. With them each day was holy, but that morn 
on which the angel said, See where the Lord was laid, joyous arose, to die that day was bliss. Long ere the dawn by devious ways... Sorry about that, Chief. <laughs> Long ere the dawn, by devious ways, o'er hills, through woods, o'er dreary wastes, they sought the upland moors, where rivers there but brooks dispart to different seas. Fast by such brooks a little glen is sometimes scooped, a plat with green swords, with green sword gay, and flowers that strangers seem, amid the heathery wild that all around fatigues the eye. In solitudes like these, thy persecuted children, Scotia, foiled a tyrant's and a bigot's bloody laws. They maintained the freedom of worship of God. There, leaning on his spear, one of the array, whose gleam in, for in former days had scathed the rose on England's banner, and had powerless struck the infatuate monarch and his wavering host. The lyred veteran heard the word of God by Cameron thundered, or by Renwick poured in gentle stream. Then rose the song, the loud acclaim of praise, the wheeling plover ceased her plaint, the solitary place was glad, and on the distant carns the watcher's ear caught doubtfully at times the breeze-borne note. But years more gloomy followed, and no more the assembled people dared in face of day to worship God, or even at the dead of night, save when the wintry storm raved fierce and thunder peals compelled the men of blood to couch within their dens. Then dauntlessly the scattered few would meet in some deep dell by rocks or canopied to hear the voice, their faithful pastor's voice, he, by the gleam of sheeted lightning, oped the sacred book. And words of comfort spake over their souls. His accents soothing came as to her young. The heath fowl's plumes when at the close of eve she gathers in, mournful, her brood dispersed by murderous sport. And o'er the remnant spreads fondly her wings. Close nestling neath her breast they cherry they cherished, cower amid the purple blooms. So, kind of what I feel like's happening, you know, it's um, the remnant has been people who got have been murderously sported on for decades now. And there's a remnant and over that remnant, you know, Father's got covering over every assembly of Zion. There will be a covert. Read Isaiah 4. You know. So. That is kind of what I wanted to say and... Um, that's kind of what I just see happening, you know. I think we're going to have a wintry storm, you know, rave fierce. I mean, wow, you know. And I hate to say it, but, you know, there's there's going to be persecution. I think we're, I think nobody could deny that. You know, you've got the, uh, if you're not familiar with the Noahide laws, thank, laws, thanks to Zionism, the seven Noahide laws, what's the penalty for blasphemy? Beheading. What a, Muslims like to do to unbelievers, infidels, behead them. But the really scary thing is if you believe in, in Messiah, if you believe in Jesus, if you believe in Yeshua, 
that's blasphemy according to Zionism, and you will, you know, the, the penalty is beheading. And you don't need two or three witnesses. You only need one accusation. It's right there in the seven laws, man. How widespread and how fast can that travel? So anyway, um, I believe there's going to be some persecution. Um, the, the, the concept of Zion, though, as I've said, is not one place. It's not relegated to one people or a uh, imposter people shall I say it's not relegated to one particular place in the world so Zion is where the people of the book are so that's my belief and for whatever degree I don't know how it's all going to play out but I am here to tell you that uh it ain't over there. <laughs> Just to make it clear, let, let me. Uh, this this is a. Let's see where we're at here. Book of Ezekiel, chapter thirty-eight. This is about the invasion. You know, people say this is the Battle of Armageddon. Um, thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Hmm. Why would you ascend? Anyway, <laughs> storms in the air and ascension is like going up in the air. Be like a cloud to cover the land, like parachutes. Oh no, it couldn't be. Um, it shall come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. When you go to Europe, what do you see? Castles. When you go to the Middle East, what do you see? Castles. When you go to China, what do you see? castles. Where is the only land in the entire world that doesn't have walled and walls and castles? I'll go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely. We've never been invaded. All of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Now, just in case you were, whatever, I don't know, foolish enough, dumb enough, ignorant enough, to think that Yerushalayim over there is this it has anything to do with this situation? In the book of Nehemiah, it names 42, ooh, weird number of judgment gates cattle gate, horse gate, water gate, sheep gate. You know, yes, there's a water gate, um, the original water gate. So, you know, you have um, 42 locks and 42 bars and 42 gates locks, bars, and gates around Jerusalem. This verse here, verse 11, is not about Jerusalem, nor is it about the land where Jerusalem is. Period. End of story. It ain't. They're not a peaceable people. Never were. They were the original terrorists bombing all over hell. Anyway, um, so n nothing in here. Much cattle in the, in the midst thereof. Um, you know, every single county, there's 3,000 counties in this country, and every single one of those counties, I would bet, has more cattle than in the entire bogus state of Israel. If they're Jews, why didn't they call it Judah? Uh, okay, shut up. Anyway, but, uh, yeah, just, just a little curiosity there. Aye, 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 aye. So, we are seeing, for whatever Whatever all it means, there's definitely a gathering. And what I'm looking forward to is getting enough of you people here that we can actually have some fellowship, you know. I mean, there's the, the most intelligent people and the most deep, deeply spiritual people, um, the most unselfish people, the humblest people, are the people that are contacting me, you know. Why is that? Uh, you know, I don't have anybody contacting me that are a bunch of flipping losers, you know, low lifes and scum, you know. <laughs> Went through that with a lot of different forms. You know, people would say, oh, you're an idiot. You're going to go to the Ozarks and they're going to come and, you know, surround you. I'm like, what? Yeah. Well, bring it on. There's enough, there might be enough armies on this earth to do that. 
though I'm making light of it, I believe it's going to happen. But that's why there's a circular region, and that's why the Missouri state seal is a circle, and there's two bears, Russian bears. You look at the state seal, it looks like that. Their paws are almost touching up here, and their feet are almost are down here. Two Russian bears. Okay. It's a belt. There's a buckle on it. Springfield is the, you know, I mean, I heard, I heard a Christian attorney say, this is the Bible belt, and Springfield is the buckle on that belt, and I'm not going to defend you as on some Indian, Native American, bogus, screwball, you know, false app, uh, act, you know, false deal. So anyway, that was had to do with my my uh, former wife's situation, legal situation. You know, he just said, "I we're going to we're going to deal with this from in a Christian situation." So we're not going not to get enough jurors together to, you know, listen to your spiel that you want me to do. Anyway, not too neither here nor there. But a circular region, so. Um, and it is. It is a circular region, almost perfectly circular. When you look at the rivers, Google Earth, look it up. Um, so for whatever reason, there is a gathering here. And it's a bunch of people that are, have been persecuted. Uh, the people that were in uh, David's um, cave, and I'll just finish with this. Let's, let's go to that. Uh, first Samuel. Come on. Back, 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 back. There we go. Pause it. All right, this is the final verse. And David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Dulam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. Now, Symbolically, however you want to look at it, when I heard Michael Peebles say, in the life of those whom Father is raising up to lead his people, everything that happened in the life of Messiah and everything that happened in the life of King David, and I would add everything that happened in the life of Joseph, is happening in the lives of those people. And everyone that was in distress... Are you in distress? And everyone that was in debt. Anybody out there in debt? No. Nah. <laughs> and everyone that was discontented. Are you discontented? And I looked at the Hebrew there, and it's like, whose soul was bitter. Mara, 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 Mara. Whose soul, Nefesh, was bitter. Gathered themselves unto him. Unto who? Unto David. David. The king. He'd been anointed king, but he ain't king yet. He's still having trouble. And he became a captain over them. And there was with him about 400 men. Okay. So they lived in the cave for a while. So, just, uh, I don't know if you, and there's a lot of caves here. You know, there's a lot of caves here. Let's say there's a cave discovered every year, every day in Missouri. Um, a lot of places, and I think we need to be underground. That's one thing I really want to hit on um, this coming, uh, these super storms and whatnot. I think everybody's going to get a f taste of this in the next few days and weeks, uh, things that are happening around the world and in this country. But um, being underground, you know, you're 60 degrees. In the summertime, is that too warm? Nope. In the wintertime, is that too cold? Nope. So 50 to 60 degrees is livable. You don't have to heat and you don't have to cool, period. Now you want to, you know, have a little wood stove or an vodka stove and have it be warmer. You know, you can, but you're not going to die. You're not going to freeze to death and you're not going to cook. You're not going to sweat to death. So, anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Zion is not over there. Not right now, it ain't. Don't know where it is. I believe the Father's building a kingdom. He's going to build that kingdom out of what? People. You have to have a lot of people together. So, all right. This is Jerry Diamond. If you're listening to this, you are the remnant. Thank you. Hope you get something out of this.